Um, please bring up um, Barbara Sukova and Pam Katz. Um, this is Pam Katz. Uh, Pam is uh, a writer in Brooklyn. Uh, she's worked with Margarita von Trata, the director of this movie, uh, a number of times, including on uh, Rosenstrasse, which I think a number of you have seen. Uh, it's a true story of resistance to the Third Reich that was uh, we've showed here a couple times in, in the German department on the Hannah Arendt Center. Um, uh, she's written a number of, 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 of movies with Margarita de Vantrata. She's also a novelist, and she's currently working on a nonfiction book uh, on, on Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weil. Is that correct? Um, Barbara Sukova uh, is uh, one of the leading actresses uh, uh, of Germany and Europe, lives in America, uh, has an international career. Um, she's a stage actress and a musician as well. Um, She's most known, I think, for her work in, I guess, New German Cinema, uh, or I'm not, maybe I shouldn't say that, um, but has done many films with Fassbinder, uh, Werner Fassbinder, uh, and she's won numerous awards, Best Young Actress in Alexanderplatz, uh, and Fassbinder's film Lola earned her the German Film Award. She won, won Best Actress at Cannes in 1986 for Rose, her role as Rosa in Rosa Luxemburg. Um, and we should uh, say that not only did the film Hannah Arendt win a Silver Lola uh, last week, just three days ago in Berlin, but uh, Barbara Sukova won Best Actress uh, at Lola Award this year for her portrayal. <laughs> I thought I'd start it off um, with a question for both of you. Um, the movie has, a, has a, a shocking beginning in a sense, first of all with the abduction of Adolf Eichmann, and then this scene where you, Barbara, are, are smoking, walking around and lying on a couch for, I think, a couple of minutes. Um, there's no words for the first few minutes of the film. So I, I, the question for Pam as a screenwriter is, what's it like to, to, to open a film um, with two scenes of, in a way, visuals but not silence. And for Barbara, you know, you're, I know you've spoken a lot about trying to portray a thinker, and, 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 and you, that scene I know sets that up. I was wondering if you could tell us what you were thinking about as you were, as you were making that scene. So uh, I don't remember what I was thinking exactly at that point, but uh, I made a point out of it to think about something um, that I've read at, uh, from Hannah Arendt. So I try to, you know, pick a problem or pick something and then just think about it. That's all. <laughs> but I don't remember what I thought about at this particular moment. And to represent Margarita von Trotta here, the director and co-writer, um, I think that these silent moments are something that are very often found during the making of the film. You have to create a film in, in, in which you portray a thinker and describe her thoughts in words, um, but it's after the actress inhabits the part of that thinker that a lot of silent moments are discovered. And it's a place where Margarita often pushes me very much and says everything is not dialogue. And uh, the character of Lotte Cooler was actually very much discovered through um, unspoken scenes where she's observing the people at the party. But for example, the silent opening, that's very, very much Margarita territory. And the, the first line, um, but Hannah, how can you defend him? When did that, when did you decide that that would be the first line as, an, I guess, throwing us off in a certain sense, not knowing that it's Mary McCarthy speaking about her husband, her, her ex-husband? Uh, it, it's hard to say how it came about as the first line, but after reading the book of correspondence between Mary McCarthy and Hannah Arendt, it quickly became clear that, that their friendship had to play a huge role in the film. And, um, you know, there is actually a conversation between them in letters that's very similar to that, and as a writer, that was just impossible to resist that kind of playful irony, and I think that it's because Margaret is a very courageous director, that she, you know, had the, the nerve to be practically begin a movie, the first spoken words about a, a brilliant thinker and her brilliant novelist girlfriend um, gossiping and talking about ex-husbands. So we very much just enjoyed the uh, counterintuitive 
first portrayal. Um, and then, of course, there was just the joy of having that line thrown to you and knowing the irony that it would create for the entire film. So, Barbara, um, is, there a, is there a scene in your mind or is there a moment in the film that you think is the emotional or intellectual heart of the film that you found was the, the, the one that you needed to, to push home the most? Well, I would say the emotional, uh, one of the emotional moments is when she talks about her father. Um, she was a very private person, Hannah Arendt. She did not um, display her emotions very much to her friends. Um, you can see in the correspondence between Mary McCarthy and um, Hannah Arendt that Mary is much more open about like her love stories and uh, personal things and Hannah Arendt always keeps things, you know, close to herself. Um, so that moment when she is talking about her father, uh, that is something, or when she talks the other, other emotional moment when, she is, when she's telling her husband about Gurs. Mm. what happened. Um, those are rare moments, and I think those are the emotional, um, most rawest points of her. Uh, intellectual, I would say, the, the, the end speech where she summons up basically what she meant, uh, I would say that would be an, an intellectual climax of the film. And did you have to feel like you really understood and, and supported her defense in order to I mean, was that, what was the work that went into that? Did it, did it have to agree? Well, um, we worked actually quite a bit on that last speech, right? Because it was really important for me to understand. First, um, the first version, there were things that were not very clear. And I felt if I don't understand it as an actor, then an audience will never understand it. So we had to really work on this that, that I understood it. The whole thing about Socrates and the inner dialogue and... Uh, I had to, to read this, I had to go back to Plato to understand this whole thing, and I'm of course not a trained philosopher, so I'm, I'm an actress, so I had to do quite a bit of work there, and uh, yes, I, there was some rewrites in there, and we corresponded, so that this was really clear to me, and hopefully then to the audience. And can I ask Pam just on that, in writing, I guess those three scenes, but really the two scenes that Barbara just talked about, the final speech, not final speech, but the, the long eight minute speech, as you said, and the, 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 the lines about her father. Um, what, were, what, were, what was your process in, in writing those and, and how, did, how did you see those as, you know, how did you work them in? Was that a speech that you found? Were elements of it taken? What were you trying to accomplish in those two those two scenes? Okay, so so interesting because they really couldn't be more different. Right. Um, in the case of the conversation about the father, actually that was uh, based on a true story that was told by the um, by Lotte Kuhler, who who was her friend and and sometimes colleague, had told that story to Elizabeth Young Bruhl. And Elizabeth Young Bruhl in turn told that story to Margareta. And in fact, Lotte Kuhler had also. Um, issues with her mother and they had a very long and, and tearful and moving conversation and um, and so that's based on a true story that was handed down um, to Margareta who then called me and said this is of course a scene that we have to include because it it brings so much of Hannah Arendt's emotional life together as Barbara said um, so you still have to write dialogue you still have to create it but the actual story of the dream and what it meant to her was true um, in the case of the speech, I think that as the intellectual climax, which I also think it is, um, the intellectual goal of the movie for me was that people who perhaps didn't have a, a philosophical background, as I myself don't have a particularly, I come from a family of philosophers, but I didn't study it myself, and I felt that if I could help to make that clear, if we would understand by the end, or at least have the ability to go out and read and understand what she meant by this oft misused catchphrase, the banality of evil, um, then the film would have, so to speak, realized its intellectual goal, certainly not its entire goal or emotional one. And I did not think that the entire answer was to be found in just reading the book, Ike One Jerusalem, although after then watching the footage and seeing the film, The Specialist, where you see a lot of Eichmann's trial, I understood far more what she meant. 
Um, and I went to several of her essays. So number one, no, it's not a, it's not a speech. I'm very flattered that people say, where did you find that speech? Because an enormous amount of effort and joint effort went into making it feel like a speech. But it comes from Eichmann in Jerusalem, various places. It comes from several of her essays, um, some questions of moral philosophy, um, political responsibility under dictatorship, and a couple of others. It also came um, from the work of some academics who wrote about her. And it was put together, it's not all quotes, you have to have connective tissue, and then you, as, as Barbara says, then you have to understand it, and something might flow academically or intellectually, might even sound like a speech, but it might still not be ready to be understood. And that was the work that I think we did together. Um, okay, so first of all, congratulations. It was really, an it's an incredible movie. I'm really happy I had a chance to see it. Um, Roger touched a little bit on this issue, but I would like to ask um, to uh, describe more this tension between uh, her emotions and uh, her th thinking, because the way I saw the movie, she was described and portrayed as without feelings, but the way I saw her, she didn't. She was n not like that, you know. She, um, I, 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 I felt like she did not let her uh, emotions shadow her thinking and the clarity of her thinking. But um, anyway, I want to hear more about this, uh, you know, how you interpret it and create this uh, tension between emotions and her rational life. Well, as I said before, she was a, a private uh, person and it is somehow a bit of a cliche that women who are smart and is, you never ask these questions about men. It's very interesting, you know, it's always this question, um, if a woman, where is her emotion? Uh, and she is, or people, some people say she was cold, uh, which I don't think at all. Um, I think the subject, the topic um, of this particular part of, of this um, um, uh, Eichmann was extremely emotional to her and uh, hurtful. And all the more she tried to to really analyze it and be really sharp and not let her personal emotions uh, go in the way. I also think um, that she thought that any display of emotion was not adequate to the horror of what actually happened. So uh, that what in her mind would have cheapened it, you know? So uh, I think for her, especially on this topic, she had to be very clear and keep her own um, emotions to a minimum. That's why she used very often irony in this book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, which people reproached her. You know, they reproached her tone very often because that was a way sh she could deal with this. This is sometimes a way of uh, dealing with emotions that you go into irony to be less vulnerable. How did the writing team choose an ending for the film? I, I guess what I would say is, first of all, we chose this time frame. Um, Hannah Arendt had a long and very interesting life, and we played with, with all of them, um, but decided in the end that, that her work on Eichmann in Jerusalem was a way not only to properly present her intellectual thought, but also her character very much in the way Barbara was just talking about, um, but also in terms of her being a bit defined by exile on a personal level. And when she experienced the, the outcry over her work, she very much feared, as you see in the film, um, that it was a kind of a third exile after Germany and after France. And it was a way to talk about her isolation and her loneliness, um, as well as a way of when you watch people repress their emotions, you also see those emotions very clearly. Um, so I guess in terms of how we ended the film, it was very important to end it with her husband, we thought. Um, they have a very unusual relationship. It was very important to end it on a personal note in that sense, but one which revealed that their closeness and their love for each other was also very much bound up with their mutual respect for each other. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about the work, 
but they're also talking about other things at the same time. And I think it was an emotional ending in that sense, that you see how much these two people who uh, left their country together, how much they love and rely on each other. Um, so I didn't think of it so much as being in the middle, that at the end of the day, she says, you find out who your friends really are. And when you, when you do leave your country and everybody turns against you, I love only my friends, as she says. And, and her husband was her best friend of all. The scene at the deathbed of uh, Kurt Blumenfeld, where you took the, the words from her correspondence with Charlotte. Um, I think that her relationship to Charlotte was uh, different from the one that she had with Blumenfeld. I think she would have not uh, said the same thing uh, to Blumenfeld uh, at the end. Uh, yes, he was very disappointed in her, but I think there were much stronger feelings of, of family, of friendship, than there was with Shalom. Um, with Shalom, it was really an intellectual friendship. Too bad, you know, they didn't see eye to eye. Uh, you are not the daughter of Israel. And then she gave that famous sentence. And what you did, you, you transposed it here. And I was personally a little bit shocked because uh, it's, it seemed to me that um, Kurt Blumenfeld would never have told her that in the same way as Shalom did. Well, first of all, um, it, we used the names of real people and real friendships, of course, but at the end of the day, you are doing amalgams and composites. You have to. Um, there's many great friendships we also had to leave out, but we know that Kurt Blumenfeld was somebody who was the most important to her. We also know that he was very, very angry with her, and it is somewhat unclear if they reconciled before he died. That's not quite known. Um, I, I guess as a writer, it's hard to resist the poetry of those letters between Hannah Arendt and Gershom Scholem. And I thought that the way in which she expressed her feelings about love and friendships and not belonging to any group or any people and loving only her friends, if we didn't have that in the movie, I think we would do the portrait of Hannah Arendt an injustice. And seeing her utter those words to Kurt Blumenfeld, who she loved so much and whose anger cut so deep I thought it worked, With, without implying in any way that her relationship to Gershom Scholem was similar to Blumenfeld. It was simply using her at a highly poetic moment in a very deeply important and sad moment in her life. While we're waiting, can I um, follow up on that? Uh, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this to you before, but one of the questions I have about the movie that, uh, that really was interesting to me was the choice in that scene in Israel at the dinner, at the table where they're eating, and Blumenfeld says, how can you say she was not an anti-Semite? And she says, well, you heard of himself, he was just following orders. Um, one of the, one, one, my, one of my reactions as someone who, you know, runs the Hannah Arendt Center is, well, she never says that he's not an anti-Semite. In fact, I think that's one of the real mis, misunderstandings of the movie, and I was wondering how you decided to put that in and if it was something you were, was that a line that you felt a lot of angst about in writing or was that just a line that, was, that came up in the writing and it wasn't the big deal in the way you were thinking about it but it's only people like us who get worried about it? Well, I don't think I'd ever say there's a line that's not a big deal but I think that what was important, there's a couple of things that are important but mainly what she was trying to say is she was trying to figure out how Eichmann saw himself. That was a hugely important facet of her work. And that was what she was communicating there. Isn't it incredible, as she puts it, that somebody who wants to talk about every detail of their work is still claiming that they're not an anti-Semite. And of course, that's part of the tone that Barbara was talking about in her book. She says, well, he wasn't an anti-Semite. Look, he had great friends who were Jewish and so on. And she said it with her very clear irony, and then that was taken literally, and she was criticized for it. So I think that part of the importance of having that scene is just showing the way in which her mind would think is that she was so open. First of all, she was so shocked at what he was really like, and she had to really look deep and cast the net wide to figure out how such a person was possible, number one, 
and how they could do such things, how to reconcile the mediocrity of the man with the monstrosity of his deeds. And for her, I think, critical to that was the fact that he didn't consider himself an anti-Semite, that he was more interested in the order than the object of the order. So I think that it's important to make that point. It was an important part of what she was talking about. But attendant upon that, and part of what, again, this is the intellectual line of the film. You needed to hear her talking about her ideas with Hans Jonas, with Kurt Blumenfeld, with her husband, because if you want to understand that speech at the end, and, and, you, and it's people who aren't, have no familiarity with these ideas, you have to build up to it incrementally, and you have to introduce these points slowly but surely so that people have a way of interpreting or at least beginning to interpret at the end. Part of the issue with Eichmann in Jerusalem, I think, is that her brilliance got in the way. She had such a philosophical background. She was using terms and concepts that were unfamiliar to people like nothing, and you have to disentangle them. So having conversations like that, I think, were important to generating uh, clarity as well as controversy. Yeah, I just want to say, if you make a movie, um, a movie like this, for example, so you worry about the people who have no knowledge about her. That's one thing. But then you, they, they might be, it might go over their heads. So you have to bring in some more clarity than you maybe want to. You don't want to be too didactic. But then you worry about the people who know a lot. And for them, you think, well, it's maybe not deep enough. It's maybe too superficial. So you have to find you know, a way uh, to kind of accommodate both. And that, for that reason, um, and also I want to say, I've always realized we all watch kind of the movie we want to see. We all pick the things that resonate with us. If you have read a book and about a topic and certain things uh, stuck out to you and are hooked in your brain, you see a film, this is what you will pick out. So it is, um, I have done Q&As about other films where somebody would say, this is a film about love, and the other person says, this is a film about loneliness. And uh, the difficulty for a writer is you know, to bring, and the director, to bring on their own agenda, but also accommodate all these different possibilities. I just want to ask um, uh, Ms. Katz if this is something that you initiated, you wanted to write about Hannah Arendt and went to the director, or uh, it was something she was interested in and went to you. Um, it, it was Margareta who, who came to me. Um, somebody had suggested, a good friend of hers, had suggested the idea to her. And um, she asked what I thought, and I was immediately enthusiastic. Um, and Margareta was far more wisely, um, more hesitant at first, because she said, how will we make a movie about a thinker? And I said, I, I didn't know, but that this was a thinker who'd made a lot of people angry. So there had to be a movie in it somewhere. And also, did you consider uh, re recreating some of the scenes with Eichmann rather than using um, the original footage? Um, absolutely not. Uh, there, there, were, there was a period where we were nervous about being able to actually use the footage um, or being able to afford it. And the idea was floated to get an actor to play Eichmann, which I think Margarita and I were both adamantly opposed to it because, and this is um, what Margarita would tell you, is that number one, if somebody does a great job, all anybody talks about is the performance. And, and then secondarily, it becomes about the performance and not about the, and in a movie in which the lead character is completely engaged and obsessed with who this person really was, you have to see the real man, nobody can act Eichmann. We, there have been three or four movies where people have played Eichmann, and some of them did so very well, and we sat and watched all those movies, and the better the performance, the more convinced we were that without the real guy, the movie wouldn't work. There's so much in our end that is uh, brilliant, but at the, sign, at the same time, um, shocking and unexpected. Um, I was wondering if, um, while reading her work, you found something like that that kind of um, shock you or uh, that you identify with? Well, the first title of the movie was called The Controversy, and I really liked that title. And I had controversy feelings at time. Uh, I mean, I completely understood why people were so angry. 
this was um, this happened in a time very close to the Holocaust, and there were people who had, you know, their entire families had been murdered, and then just the, you know, the word of banality could trigger something. I mean, it was it was like a slap in the face, I think, for a lot of people, and who were just not in the mood to take irony on that topic. And uh, so I found, I found in a way, shocking that Hannah Arendt, with all her intelligence, uh, and I think she she wanted to provoke, she wanted a discussion, she did not want to hurt, but that she was not aware that that could happen, and I I really believe she was not aware of that. And uh, she was disappointed that it did not come to a you know to that discussion that's that intellectual discussion. Um, yeah, that that shocked me that she did not get that because she actually seemed to me like a sensitive person. She was such a great friend to have to her friends. They said she had a genius for friendship. So somebody who does not seem to be um, uh, insensitive. That was shocking. Can you talk about uh, your decision to include her relationship with Heidegger and uh, what that process was like? First of all, I think it's important to point out that if we had decided to make the movie that was the love story of Hannah Arendt and Martin Heidegger, we'd have made this film 10 years ago. Um, that was what everybody wanted. Um, and it was something that we rejected from the first moment going forward. So f because everybody was telling us this was the story, we had to figure out if this part of her life was, you know, was important enough to show in a film where we had decided to focus on those years in the 60s. And the answer became yes for, for I would say, these reasons. Um, the first is that this is a movie about her as a thinker. It is a movie where she discovers this notion of, of Gedankenlosigkeit, of, of Eichmann's inability to think. And Heidegger was the professor who she always said was the man who taught her how to think. Um, and therefore, a lot of, and she said this herself, a lot of what he taught her on an intellectual, in an intellectual way uh, formed the basis of much of her future work. So intellectually, it seemed difficult to, to not include that. But there was another point, and I'm very happy, and it's quite subtle in the film, I think, but I'm very happy to see that a lot of people have gotten it. And that's what she says in the speech at the end. She says, you know, I like to think that thinking can prevent catastrophes, you know, when the chips are down. And Heidegger was a very good example of somebody who knew quite well how to think and, and whose thinking still failed him. And I think that there's a sense, and, and and it's certainly true that she loved him, although as I think we make clear, I don't feel that he was the love of her life for a variety of reasons, but she loved him and she deeply respected him. And the very quality that she thought might save humanity failed with him, and that was hugely disappointing for her. So for me, that disappointment is not just intellectual, it was really emotional. Her cigarette seemed almost like a character in the film, and I'm wondering if that was uh, historically accurate, that she was that kind of chain smoker, or that you needed to use it as a prop to kind of animate the thinking process. Uh, we actually heard from one of her nephews that she smoked much more than we have to smoke in the movie. <laughs> she actually died with a cigarette in her hand. She was smoking all the time. She smoked in her oxygen tent. Um, I wondered if you could talk about the process of getting the movie made in terms of having a woman and a thinker at the center of the film. Was there resistance to that or excitement from producers? And I don't know if I would say it was because she was a, a woman thinker. I think it's difficult to get intellectual films made. Margareta first went to a producer she knows very well who's produced many of, 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 her, of Margareta's films and, and he had never heard of Hannah Arendt for starters, and, and then when we explained to him who she was, he didn't think anybody would go to see a movie about this, and it wasn't until we actually found quite a courageous young, happened to be female producer, was, uh, who'd read a lot of Hannah Arendt, and was a big fan of hers, and she was perhaps, couldn't 
be positive that a lot of people would come to see the film, but she adored her and thought she was incredibly important and was prepared to fight for it. You have to fight for any small, serious film, I think. But it's been very gratifying that the films had huge box office in Germany and actually just opened this week in France um, to even greater success. So. Um, Again, I would say it's, it wouldn't be to encourage people to make more films about women thinkers, but just to make more serious and, and provocative films. And, and Barbara, how would you compare playing Hannah Arendt to playing Rosa Luxemburg? I mean, it is extraordinary from my point of view that you've played two of the most important and fascinating intellectual women of the 20th century. I, oh, I was much younger when I played Rosa Luxemburg. I th um... Rosa Luxemburg was an activist, you know, um, and Hannah Arendt was a thinker. So that was a big difference. But uh, Hannah Arendt liked Rosa Luxemburg, and Hannah Arendt's mother was actually a big fan of uh, Rosa Luxemburg. And I was very happy to hear when Margarete, and I think you were there too at this meeting with uh, Lotte Köhler, when she told um, her that I was playing uh, Hannah Arendt, she said Hannah Arendt would be happy that the actress who played Rosa Luxemburg <laughs> would play here. I have to say, uh, Margarete von Trotter had uh, ran into quite some resistance that I played this part because I so don't look like Hannah Arendt. These are two incredibly strong women. Mm. Um, you know, uh, and... Who are both not feminists. Who are both not feminists. interesting, although they had such an influence in their time also on uh, Both on were women. betrayed by friend, by, by, I mean, Hannah Arendt in a certain way and Rosa Luxemburg by friends and, and colleagues in a certain yeah. way. I'm just wondering if, if, if playing these two, they came together in your mind or they were totally separate? Because there's a lot that holds them no, together. No, they, they came together in the sense uh, Rosa Luxemburg was much more in all her letters. She was... Um, she displayed her emotions more. She was talking about love. She was talking about every little detail, like what her underwear looked like. Um, and um, Hannah had this idea about love that it was an otherworldly thing. She called it otherworldly. She thought it did not belong into the world. It was something very private. So it was much harder for me to find out things about Hannah Arendt. She was very resistant. I had a photo from her that Jerome Cohens gave me, and I looked, I had it in my dressing room when I was doing the film and also before the film when I was preparing, and I always had the feeling she looked really skeptical at me and kind of strict. <laughs> and uh, then after the movie was finished and now we have these wonderful numbers in Germany, um, you know, in the box office, I have looked at the photo and I think she looks a little kinder now. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, um, it was very kind of you both to come. Thank you very much.